And we'll go live in five, four, three, two, one. Good afternoon. Welcome back to the Climate and Fisheries stream. This is Paul Skowinski with Extension Lakes. I'll be moderating the session this afternoon. Thanks to Wisconsin Lake and Pond Resource for sponsoring this morning's and this afternoon's climate and fisheries sessions. Please remember to post your questions into the Q&A window within the conference platform, not in the chat box. To the right of the presentation screen that you are watching right now, you should see a window with chat, polls, uh, actually, there are no polls for this one, so chat and Q&A tabs at the top. Make sure to choose that Q&A tab to, answer your, uh, to ask your questions, or you can add your vote to a question that has already been asked. Our speaker this afternoon is Peter Jacobson. Peter is now retired after serving as a fisheries scientist for the Minnesota DNR for 32 years. His research on cold water fishes and their habitat led to an extensive conservation program for protecting the water quality of deep lakes in Minnesota. Peter will be speaking on protecting cold water fish habitat in Minnesota lakes. Peter, you can take it away. Great. Thank you, Paul. Hello, everyone. Um, we're going to talk about what I think is a pretty cool fish um, that has some really interesting characteristics. But even more importantly than that is the lakes that that fish live in. There's some really nice lakes that warrant a lot of conservation attention, even if they didn't have Cisco. So, and then I'm gonna talk about how Minnesota has a, has a pretty extensive program for protecting those lakes. And at the end, I'm gonna suggest some ways that we can extend some of these concepts, not only to Wisconsin, but to Michigan as well. So I hope you find interest in this. So we've got a number of native cold water fish in, in some of our deeper lakes in Minnesota. You know, the real iconic ones are like lake trout. Um, some of the uh, more unusual ones are like our burbot, which, which uh, is, is a cold water fish. It requires deep, clear, cold, oxygenated water, just like lake trout. We also have lake whitefish and cisco. And all four of these fish are pretty important fish in the lakes that they do occur. And we've had a pretty extensive research effort aimed at, at several of these fish, but especially Cisco. And I'm gonna talk mostly about Cisco. And really in Minnesota, we're talking uh, central, north central and northeastern Minnesota where our deepest and coldest and coolest uh, lakes are. So um, why, is, why is Cisco important and why are we studying? Well, from a fisheries point of view, they're just outstanding forage. They're very high energy content, very oily, pr provide just absolute excellent forage base for a number of predator fish. And we see our best growth rates for walleyes, northern pike, muscalunge, and lake trout in lakes that have a lot of Cisco, especially the smaller forms of Cisco, which they can they can utilize as forage. So that's, that's why we got involved from a fisheries point of view, but there's also very much a water quality and a climate aspects of this fish as well. Um, the first thing, it's pretty widespread in Minnesota. We have over 650 lakes um, in the state that have them. So it, it's always nice to study a, an animal that's, that, uh, that it, it exists in a lot of lakes and good numbers that, that are easy to sample. Wisconsin, uh, I know you guys have done a census of your Cisco lakes. I think it's on the order of 200. So you guys also have a lot of Cisco lakes as well. Um, <clears throat> Cisco are declining in Minnesota. That's really what got us really interested in this. And we have a pretty extensive uh, survey effort uh, through the Minnesota DNR fisheries looking at all, all of our Cisco lakes. And we've seen the average catch rates of those Cisco's decline really since the late 70s, early 80s. And we, we started doing our research uh, with that in mind. And, and, and there's two really big reasons why we think that's occurring. Number one, land use is changing. And there's more nutrient runoff into our lakes. That's, and I'll show you why that's important for Cisco. Also the climate's warming. That's about the time when when the climate really started changing in Minnesota was late 70s, early 80s. So both of those uh, we think are involved in that decline of, of Cisco across the state. 
The other thing is uh, they're very noticeable when they die in the summer, when conditions get really bad, you have some really hot weather and really still weather and you start to lose oxygen down deep, they actually come to the surface and die. So it's, it's very visible when they're, when they're under stress. And that actually gave us some uh, excellent data to understand what kind of conditions uh, it took for those kind of fish to die. So <clears throat> the, uh, the, the main, the main limnological aspect of Cisco that's really important to this story is they live down deep in cold water where, <clears throat> where they need a lot of oxygen. Cisco are a cold water fish and they need a lot of oxygen. And only some lakes have a lot of oxygen. It takes a really clear, really good water quality lake to have water, to have oxygen all throughout the summer during that really stressful period of time. So when we, when we do acoustic surveys or gill net surveys, they are the fish that are out suspended over deep water. And if you, if, if you guys uh, fish a lot and have a good depth finder, you will see their arcs out below the thermocline in deep water. So the amount of oxygen down below, below that thermocline is critical. And that, <clears throat> excuse me, that amount of oxygen is directly tied to the amount of nutrients and sediment coming into a lake, okay? As you get more nutrients and sediment coming into the lake, that promotes algae growth, especially the little phytoplankton cells that are out floating out in the open water. When that algae starts to die, it, it's, it rains down into that deep water. And as it decomposes, that's what takes the oxygen out of the water. So the more nutrients, the more algae, the more organic material you have raining down into the deep water, the faster you're gonna lose your oxygen below. And that's bad for a cold water fish like Cisco. The other aspect of that is, you know, uh, lakes mix and they mix late in the fall and early in the spring. And when they mix early in the spring, that, that completely replenishes the oxygen down below the thermocline at the very start of the spring. Then that thermocline essentially locks it away for the rest of the summer. So what that lake has for deep water oxygen is what it's gonna have for the rest of the summer. So by the time the summer is over, that can get very low and that's what really hurts Cisco. So there's a direct connection between the amount of nutrients and sediment coming into a lake and also the amount of time that that lake is stratified. And those are two really critical components to this story. <clears throat> so in, in Minnesota, we were fortunate to have a, a really good lake modeler named Heinz Steffen, literally a German engineer, world-class lake modeler. And we worked with him and projected what the effects of climate change would be on that duration of stratification and the amount of nutrients and sediment coming into the lake, or given the amount of the, the amount of nutrients and sediment coming into the lake. And he was able to project what those oxygen concentrations were below that thermocline, even after extensive warming in Minnesota. And the good news on that was out of that 650 lakes, there's about 176 of those lakes that are deep enough and clear enough that they'll still provide oxygen down below the thermocline, even in the end of the summer for cold water fish like Cisco. So, you know, so much of the, so much of the news on climate is, is doom and gloom. This is actually a, a real bright story. It, it's, it's a story where we can actually do something locally about climate change and I'll, and I'll explain <clears throat> exactly what. So it turns out nearly all of those 176 lakes are in the forested part of Minnesota. All right. And that's going to be a, key part of the story here. <clears throat> and and that's, that's not an accident. We find our best water quality lakes in the forested portion of the state. And the reason is what happens to that rain and snowfall when it falls in that lake's watershed is it, snow, it soaks into those beautiful forested soils, goes into the groundwater and enters our lake as groundwater. There is nothing better for for uh, uh, having water come into a lake than groundwater. So it's absolutely critical 
that we protect those forest soils and those forested lands. Um, that is the reason we have good water quality in northern Minnesota. And I know it's, <clears throat> it's also the, the reason you guys have good water quality in, <clears throat> in the northern part of Wisconsin as well. <clears throat> so what are the threats? Um, you know, the, the first one is urbanization. As you get more and more people living in a watershed, more concrete, more impervious surfaces, shopping centers, parking lots, roads, all of that contributes to a, a degradation of water quality. So that's, that's one of the huge concerns about uh, our forest land in Minnesota. And we're seeing that. It, people want to live in lakes country. And not only do they want to live around a lake, but if they can't live around a lake, they want to near, live near a lake. So we're seeing a lot of growth in, in Minnesota in, in our lakes country. The other is conversion to agriculture. Agriculture is intensifying throughout the state of Minnesota and it is uh, all throughout the country, it is all throughout the world. And we're seeing conversions of our forest land into, into uh, intensive agriculture. And I think we all know that the, the water quality aspects of that are pretty daunting. Um, we're seeing some pretty significant acreages, especially through central and north central Minnesota, being converted to agriculture. So those are the two big kind of concerns that, that we have. Um, we're losing forest lands and the watersheds of not only those Cisco lakes, but, but all of our lakes in, in north central and northern Minnesota. <coughs> <Excuse> <coughs> So what are the tools to uh, protect some of those forests? Well, in, in, fortunately in Minnesota, we've got a number of them. And really the, the, the issue is on private lands. You know, we've, we're fortunate in Minnesota to have a lot of public land, a lot of national forest land, state forest land, county forest land that is actually managed pretty well in terms of water quality. The real question mark is what happens on private forest lands. And that's where we're seeing the conversions to more urbanized land uses, uh, more agricultural land uses. So the, the real conservation battleground for, for North Central and Northern Minnesota is on private forest lands. And, and in, in Minnesota, we're, we're very fortunate to have a number of programs that are available for, for uh, private woodland owners to maintain their lands in forested land cover. And we have a number of tax incentive programs that actually uh, either reimburse the, the landowner for some of their property taxes or lower the property tax rate. And those are very popular programs and extremely, uh, uh, extremely valuable if you wanna protect the forest lands and the watersheds of our lakes. We also are very fortunate in Minnesota to have a percent of our sales tax that goes to conservation. And one eighth of that percent of the sales tax goes to clean water projects. Another eighth of a percent goes to fish and wildlife habitat um, protection and restoration programs. That amounts to about $180 million a year available for these kind of programs. Now this is, they're both competitive. So this uh, Cisco Lakes conservation program has to compete with all the other water quality and fish habitat uh, requests that are out there, but we've actually have been pretty successful. And a majority of that money is going to private forest conservation easements. And that essentially, and I think I have a slide, let me check. Yep, <clears throat> and that, that essentially is where we're paying a private forest landowner to agree to keep his land forested into perpetuity. That means they'll never develop it and they'll never farm it. And it is per, into perpetuity. It's actually registered on the deed. They get a pretty handsome check out of that. One of the programs, for example, pays 60% of the, the appraised value of that land. So it's very significant. So that's a, just an outstanding tool where we can permanently protect private forest lands in the watersheds of these really important deep clear lakes in Minnesota. And we, <clears throat> we've got a number of these uh, um, lakes that we're, we're targeting right now. 
and we've been doing this enough years now where we're actually starting to see a difference. We're actually moving the needle on some of these watersheds. We have a goal of uh, to protect 75% of the watershed and keep it forested. And there's actually some water quality modeling that uh, that went into that 75% that um, really, really has helped in an effort like this. It's, it is so important, especially to funding um, entities that you have a goal that when you reach that goal and it's measurable, you can say we're done, we're gonna move to the, lake, the next lakes watershed. And that has been truly um, a, a really effective way of doing some watershed and lake conservation work on these special sets of lakes. So we're really, we're really proud of that. We're proud of what we have available in Minnesota, but I'm also gonna talk about what might be uh, some future potential for not only Wisconsin, Michigan and Minnesota uh, towards the end here. And uh, just one other, one other thing I wanna make, one other point I wanna make on that map. It's, it's we very much have a checkerboard land ownership pattern in Minnesota. And I know Wisconsin does and Michigan does as well. Again, it's that mosaic, kind of a complex mosaic of national forest lands, state forest lands, county forest lands and private lands. So you're working in a pretty complicated landscape, but this definitely is targeting private lands in that watershed. And also note that many of these lands are a considerable distance away from the lake. And that's a critical thing. You know, so much of what we do is, is, is focused on the lake shoreline itself, and it should. We need good conservation practices right on the lake shoreline. What, happen, what happens well away from the lake also affects that lake water quality. And remember that sponge, that sponge slide. Those forest, forested lands are providing that sponge that truly provides that excellent groundwater into a lake. So it's a fairly large landscape that we have to deal with in terms of protecting the water quality in the lake. It's not just about the shoreline. Really important. Uh, <clears throat> we, uh, well, I think one of the real success stories of this is we really engaged the forest conservation world. Um, you know, the water, the lake water quality and water and fish habitat and the world I'm usually used to has been a little siloed up from the forest conservation world. Not always, there's always been some interaction, but the thing that really drove us to interact much more closely and integrate our efforts much more closely was our realization that it's those forested lands in the lake watersheds that we absolutely have to protect, just critical. And we actually found the forest conservation world to be very receptive of our ideas. Our ideas. They fully understand the, the value of those forests in, in promoting good water quality. So they were very welcome. And a lot of these um, private forest conservation easements have really benefited and, and fit into a lot of their their plans as well. So, it, you know, if, if there's one thing that I can uh, suggest to people from Wisconsin is to do the same thing. And I'm sure there's those kind of efforts going on right now. Um, wonderful. Increase them, expand them. It, it really truly is the way to protect some of these lakes that are still in good shape. Um, we've, we've even got, gotten to the point in Minnesota where we're combining our watershed planning with our forest planning. And we've got some real forward thinkers uh, in Minnesota, Lindbergh Ekela, if, if you've ever seen him uh, speak, he used to be with Minnesota Forest Resources Council, and now he's with uh, the Board of Water and Soil Resources in Minnesota. Dan Stewart, also with Board of Water and Soil Resources. These people are taking <clears throat> forest conservation plans and marrying directly into some of our watershed plans. And they came up with this concept called the landscape stewardship plan. And it's really been effective. It directly takes into account our water quality and our fisheries, um, fisheries uh, needs and combines them with those forest conservation needs and, and pre presenting some just wonderful plans on how to do this at a landscape scale. And again, we're fortunate in Minnesota to have the funding to do some of these things at a landscape scale. <clears throat> and then um, 
getting towards the end here. We, uh, we, uh, you know, we, we're very uh, focused on the water quality and fish habitat, cold water fish habitat aspects of this, but. Most forest conservation easements that we're doing that are funded as part of that are doing wonderful things for a whole lot of animals and plants and ecosystems, biodiverse ecosystems all throughout the northern part of the state. You know, there's a lot of organisms that still rely on forests and this work is gonna benefit them. And it's, I think that's something that we don't trumpet enough that some of our water quality and, and fish habitat and water and lake conservation work is going to directly benefit a lot of different species. And in, in Minnesota, we still are fortunate to have intact forests, intact watersheds, forested watersheds. We have essentially a landscape that's operating still at an ecosystem scale, at a landscape scale, and that's huge. So this, I think this story and if I had one take home point that I want everybody to understand, this is, this is really a landscape conservation issue, not just Cisco, not just these deep clear lakes. These concepts apply to all of our lakes that are still have good water quality in the, in the forested portion of Minnesota. And I know Wisconsin has, has a number of those as well. So keep that in mind. <clears throat> um, this is my second to last slide. I've, I've got one more slide where we're going to talk about how to extend some of these concepts to, to Wisconsin and, and Michigan. Um, we made essentially a back of the envelope calculation on what it would take to protect all 176 of those Cisco refuge lakes, right? And using that 75% protection of the watershed level. We calculated all the private land in those watersheds where it would be necessary to bring it up to that level. And we came up with 300,000 acres needs to be protected. We used a rough <clears throat> value of $600 per acre. And roughly that back of the envelope number is $180 million a year. Now, before our dedicated sales tax, um, revenue source, that would have been a laughable figure, right? But that's a very doable figure. Remember, there's 180 or $190 million available every year now. And again, not all of it is gonna to go to, into this program. A lot of it is being, being spent in the, uh, the agricultural part of the state where we have some serious water quality problems. But a good portion is now being put up into the forested part of the state. Those kind of goals actually are achievable. And to me, that is just a, a wonderful thing. It, it really is. <clears throat> so finally, um, I'd really like to put some thought and, and maybe generate some discussion on, on how to extend some of these concepts. Um, Wisconsin has very similar lakes to Minnesota. Michigan does as well. And the, the three states are actually pretty similar. They have a, a forested northern part of the state where the water quality is still in pretty good shape. Uh, a southern part of the state where we see a much, a much more intensive agriculture and a lot more people. You know, our population centers are in the Minneapolis, St. Paul, um, St. Cloud parts of the state. Uh, Wisconsin, Milwaukee, Madison, the, the big population centers are in the, the southern part. Of the state. Same with same with uh, the same with Michigan. So, what what we really need to do is look, I think, at an ecoregion approach to this. And the reason I bring this slide up, and it may be kind of hard to hard to see, but I hope you can get the gist of this. We uh, we did an analysis with uh, Wisconsin, Michigan, and Minnesota scientists. And we've got a, an article here for the, the scientists in the group. Um, Katie Hine was kind of the main Wisconsin rep on this work. And we essentially estimated how much of that oxygen below the thermocline has been lost in the last century. And we know some of it has been lost because of land use change you know, converting to agriculture, um, urbanized land uses. And we also know the climate has warmed during that time as well. And we use pretty 
sophisticated model that actually divide those two components into, into each of those components and model them separately, add them up and see how much we've lost. And if you look at this map, it, it really goes with what common sense would tell you. So the red dots are, are lakes. These are all lakes that are that are deep enough to stratify. It's not just Cisco lakes. So they're all lakes that have a thermal client and oxygen below. The lakes in red, the red dots are the lakes that have lost most of their oxygen below the thermal client. And they are in the Southern and agricultural and urbanized part of the three states, very much in common. The whiter dots are lakes that are still in really good shape. They haven't lost a lot of oxygen. We, we still have some excellent deep clear lakes that hold their oxygen well into the summer. Those are the targets of this kind of, uh, this kind of program. And there's also a transition in between where you see a lot of the pink. Those are lakes at risk. They're still probably worth saving, but they're seriously at risk. And a lot of that is because of agricultural and urban um, pressures pushing northward. <clears throat> so I think we've got a lot in common. And I think there's some really excellent opportunities in the future to think of this as, as a landscape scale. This, the Lake District we have in these three states is world-class, right? It is, it truly is. And it, 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 it warrants a lot of attention. And we have the wonderful uh, um, funding source in Minnesota. I, I'm not sure what's available in Wisconsin or Michigan, but I know there's, there's, there's a need to do more. There's even a need to do more in, Mich in Minnesota, even with all the funding sources we have. And the reason I bring this up is with the new administration, there's gonna be some pretty significant conservation efforts dealing with climate change. And one of the programs that's being uh, proposed is the, uh, the protecting 30% of the lands by 2030. And protecting means essentially what we're doing, keeping forested lands forested, private forested lands forested. You know, as, as residents of these three states, we should be raising our hand and say, hey, we've got a set, we've got a shovel ready set of lakes ready to go. We know that if we do on the ground conservation, to keep those forested land forested in the watersheds of these really important lakes, we can do wonderful things for these lakes across all three states. And I think we should try to get, get to be first in line in those new federal initiatives. And <clears throat> how to do that, I think is we, we, we definitely have to combine forces. Um, number one, if there's any federal agency people listening in, hello, we, we need your help, please advocate for us. Number two, if there's any citizen champions out there and and believe me if, if you're a citizen champion you, you you are worth your weight in gold you can do so much more than than an agency person is and i can tell you that from a retired agency point of view to get these kind of big initiatives done so the the place one of the places to do this and there's probably a number of, of different places to do this but the one i'm going to suggest is the midwest glacial lakes partnership and it's one of the uh, small local partnerships that's part of a bigger national fish habitat partnership that um, is out there. And it, it just got fully funded in this last congressional session, which is, which is, really, which is really awesome. It got fully authorized. So we have this formal mechanism to work on these really multi-state landscape scale kind of initiatives. And we're fortunate to have this one it covers the, the northern parts of all three of our states and Indiana and Indiana, interestingly, has some Cisco Lakes as well. This would be a perfect place for all of us to get together. And I know Joe Noner is the coordinator of that group. And I know that he's very receptive to people's input on this. So if, if there's any citizen advocates out there citizen champions out there, get a hold of Joe Noner. They have a website, his email is on there. He's also presenting as part of this conference as well. So I'm assuming his email address is, is in part of the system. Get a hold of Joe Noner. And I, I truly think we could do something special um, across all of these three lakes and, and really preserve the, like I said, world-class 
Lake District that we have. And with that, thank you. And I'd be happy to entertain any questions. Thanks, Pete. Uh, just for everyone's information, Joe is presenting later today in one thirty session on the Glacial Lakes Fish Habitat Partnership and the Conservation Planner tool on their website. Excellent. Um, Peter, we have one question so far. I'll just remind everybody to use the Q&A tab to put, put your, your questions into the Event Mobi conference platform so that we can see them and we can pass those along to Peter. Uh, before we get to the first question, I'll start out with one. Um, you mentioned 176 lakes, I think, that you were working with, these cold water lakes. It looked like some of those were on the map within the boundary waters. Is that right? That's right. So those ones are, are pretty well protected already? They are. A, a okay. number of them are. A number of them are already have achieved that 75% level of uh, protection. And we're not going to work on those. Uh, we we uh, have a category called vigilance in our lake management um, uh, framework within Minnesota that these lakes that are well protected, we just want to keep them well protected. And, and the reason is even boundary water lakes are not without risks. We have some serious mining proposals that uh, could, could impact water quality in the boundary water. So although we're not actively looking for private forest lands in those watersheds, they're still on the radar and and uh, monitoring these uh, these future activities that could could hurt them as well. So yeah, that's definitely an important point. Out of those 176, roughly, I'm going to say half are probably already achieved that 75 percent protection level simply by being in a national forest or state forest or protected area like the Boundary Waters Canoe area. Great. Okay, the first question is, uh, they say, this is fabulous work. Is it part of an established or branded statewide water resources protection program, or is it more of an effort to leverage multiple programs and partners and funding to get this protection work done? It really is a multi-partner effect. It's loosely called the, the, the Tulabi Lakes uh, conservation effort or Cisco Lakes conservation effort. Cisco and Tulabi are the same thing. Tulabi is a real common name for the fish in Minnesota, but there's no one overarching project manager or, you know, direct website or direct um, umbrella kind of part of this effort. It truly has been a number of people and a number of efforts and a number of agencies um, um, doing the work. And it, 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 it's amazing how it's resonated. People, <clears throat> people understand it, and it, and it, and again, it's it's not so much because of the fish itself; it's because of the lakes they live in. And when we brought this out there and started talking to lake associations and, and sportsmen's groups and county boards and local watershed districts, they get it. They when they saw the list of lakes. They're some of the nicest lakes in the state, and they they would warrant conservation whether they they had that fish or not. So it just it just seemed to resonate. It caught caught legs, um, caught some legs, and uh, and has been a pretty successful program. But again, this this these concepts really apply to more than just the deep clear lakes. Any of the lakes with a, a good forested watershed would benefit from these these kind of concepts and these this kind of conservation. Okay, there's also a comment in there, the Q&A that just mentions how the Midwest Glacial Lakes Partnership also has grant funding available too on their website. And they give their, their website there, midwestglacialakes.org. Um, that is it for the questions in the, the Q&A at this point. Uh, let's just remind everybody, go ahead and throw more questions in there. We have 10 minutes still for this session. Um, Peter, I was wondering if uh, what kind of message do you find is most successful to getting, uh, whether it's citizens or other uh, organizations, interested in protecting cold water fisheries? Is there certain fish species that they, the anglers are targeting, or uh, what is it that motivates people to conserve those lakes? Well, definitely from the angler's point of view, it's the the the, the growth rates of 
the fish we like to fish for, walleye, northern pike, muscalinge, northern pike, they benefit from cisco. We see our biggest trophy fish in lakes that have excellent cisco forage and, and our, our anglers get it and, and they like this kind of program. Interestingly, from the lake lakeshore owner and lake homeowner point of view, um, they get it as well. And, and, and when, I, when I was working for the DNR, I would go to lake, lake associations of these refuge lakes and explain the program. And, and I knew darn well that a good share of the crowd would not believe in the climate change aspects of this. And that's fine. And I told them right up front, that's fine. And I wouldn't argue with them. I said, just wait until you hear the fix, the solution, and you'll like it. And they did, because the solution is to keep the water quality good in their lake. And everybody's for that. So I think, I think it just was kind of a fortunate sequence of events where this one really resonated with a lot of different people and, uh, and has kind of contributed uh, to its success. Okay, thank you. Well, I haven't seen any more questions come in yet. We'll still give it a minute here. And uh, if there are no other questions, we can end the session a bit early. Is there anything else that, that you'd like to highlight in your work with the cold water lakes? Yeah, again, one more plug to the Midwest Glacial Lakes Partnership. They do have a, a grant program. It's modest. I think the goal here is to add some zeros and commas. So um, that's that's the big that's the big goal here. So. All right, we just had a new question come in. How do you identify landowners that are interested in protecting their lands? Does your program reach out to them or do they find you? We we have targeted lakes that we're doing we're actively seeking out landowners. So we'll look at a map and look at the biggest forested landowners in the watersheds of those lakes and then do outreach to them. That may be the form of a letter. Um, there's been a number of radio spots and little TV interviews that, where the word gets out, but it's primarily direct contact from uh, water uh, watershed conservation organizations directly. Um, talking with uh, private forest landowners. Okay. The next comment says, thanks for emphasizing the duff layer. Don't rake up the leaves and twigs. I keep that sponge that Peter talked about. Uh, there's one more comment. Thanks so much. I'm in intrigued by your idea to join forces across states and look for federal funding opportunities to protect forested lands. Any further thoughts on how to start this? Yeah, I, it, it takes advocates and it, it takes a combined multi-state advocacy effort. And that's where I think Midwest Glacial Lakes Fish Habitat Partnership could do that because there are member states, member state agencies that have the capacity to advocate this from a multi-state level. So my my suggestion would be to get a hold of Joe Noner, and Joe is just an absolute expert at networking and, and thinking big picture. And at some point, you know, a group like that can go to some of the federal agencies that, for example, might implement the 30, the 30% the by 2030 plan and get Midwest Glacial Lakes on that, on their radar that we're ready for a pretty substantial program um, to do this kind of work across all three states. Great, thanks. We'll give it a, another minute here to see if anything else rolls into the Q&A. Uh, at this point, we're through all the questions and comments that are in there at, at this point. not seeing any more coming in. So uh, we'll wrap it up there, Peter. Thanks so much for presenting today. We have a lunch break now until 1.30 when the afternoon workshops start. And again, Joe Noner is going to be talking about the Glacial Lakes Partnership at 1.30. So you can check that out. Now is your chance to take your lunch outside and enjoy this beautiful day. We'll see you all back here for more of Wisconsin Water Week at 1.30.